It's like opiated country yeah. music. <laughs> Jeremy, Everybody. long time no yes. see. Yes, it is good to see. You? Very good, thanks. Uh, why don't you step in this way and maybe you could take a peek at some of these hunks of wood that I laid out for you uh, to look at today. Holy moly. These are some guitars that I've been using over the years for different purposes and I thought you might like to take a look at them. Absolutely. I remember a lot of these. Well, I'm Bobby Driver. I kind of played music most all my life and and taught full time for the last 20 years and and even taught uh started teaching at Phil Johnson's old time picking emporium when I was a teenager so I can't say I've been a full time teacher since I since I was 16 but off and on I've always kind of you know had music in my life and either played around or just kind of stayed on the fringes of the music scene, you know, uh, doing what I could, but found that teaching was a great way to stay at home and do what I really liked, which was playing music. Now, what kind of music do you play mostly? Uh, it's mainly uh, uh, jazz-tinged blues music. Uh, now that I'm kind of stepping back from the music scene, I just play mainly the old fingerstyle country blues type playing. Uh, that's that's my forte and it's always been it's my first love uh blues music was the first music that i latched on to as as a youngster and um i learned from a lot of the old guys like i went down to atlanta uh and played with uh, buddy moss who was one of the top piedmont blues men of the 30s and i was a friend of mine gave me his address back in 77. His address, like yeah. he went to his house. Yeah, yeah, and we I just stayed with him for a while and, and we just, we never really had a guitar lesson. We just sat around drinking liquor, watching TV and playing guitars and, and every now and then somebody would say, oh, that's nice, you know, and <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't like the usual knee to knee tutelage that you get from old bluesmen. I had actually met Buddy once in Washington, D.C., uh, but briefly, just hi, how are you, love your music, that was it. Yeah. So he really didn't know who the hell I was when I showed up at his door, totally unannounced, <laughs> with a bottle of rye whiskey in my hand. And we just had a hell of a time for a couple of days. And then I drove back up the coast to Harrisonburg. This is a uh, 33 model uh, a Dobro, the one with the Hawaiian scene. Uh, and it was made by the original Dopiero brothers when they bought their patent back from Mose Wright in the, in the late 60s. This was built in the early 70s. And um, it's a gem of a guitar. And it's, you know, the fact that it's over 50 years old and it's, it's been used for street singing across the United States. And it's still here to talk about it. <laughs> so it's still playable, yeah. Which is which is a miracle in itself. Now this thing here is a Gibson L7 from '48, and it has the original McCarty rig, which was uh, McCarty had uh, become the uh, technical advisor for Gibson, and his claim to fame to me with the, for the McCarty years were these pickups that he created. Um, it uh, has a beautiful tone. I'll, I'll go ahead and play it as a as a as an old time jazz box with no amplification. But for pumping out Freddie Green chords, see, it's got that nice Freddie Green sound little thin for my taste like if I want to really chomp on big band chords this uh, Eastman is the one I prefer but this one it's got it
There's that sound one. Then this one here is a 68 Trini Lopez Custom, which was based on the design of the Barney Kessels. What's the difference between this and a Barney Kessel? That's what, when Barney, I first saw this, I thought that's what this was. Yeah, the, the, everybody, and lots of times I'll see a Barney Kessel and think it's a Trini. The triangular sound holes are a feature of the Trini Lopez, as are the triangular yeah. appointments yeah. Uh, on the neck. So that the triangular motif is pure Trini Lopez, plus it has the triangular motif engraved into the uh, tailpiece. Mm -hmm. There's a hole poked here. That was a Bigsby. Okay. Uh, there's a Bigsby that goes with this. Uh, it being a 68, it does not have PAFs. It has straight up humbuckers. Neck plays like a dream. And uh, in terms of tone, it's induplicable because it really is like a giant parlor guitar. Uh, it's um, maple, maple sides back and top. Yeah. Even the uh, even the top is maple. So that's why the woody sound. Through a uh, Fender Twin, there's no other sound. Mm. It's beautiful. It sounds like a church organ. Tell me about it. you got two toggle switches. Okay, it's set to neck pickup here, blend, and then farthest away would be bridge. Okay. This is a bypass simply to activate it on, off, on, back to off again. Uh, this is a 75 silver face fender that I used for bar gigs back in the 80s. I haven't used it since I switched over to a twin. And mm -hmm. I got a I got a PV as well. jazz box by vein although I have used it for rockabilly you know, it's got the, it's got the wang when, when you need it but uh, mainly for practical purposes I just use it for cocktail music this is about all I got out of it so that's this one uh, it's a 17 incher and was it's a factory second from the Eastman company. It's such a, it's an Eastman before they started putting their name on the headstock. This is the one that I remembered from when I worked at Guitar and Amps. Mm -hmm. Well, the deal was um, a guy that I, I, the guy I bought it from had a satchel of them that he had gotten from the factory in Clarksville, which is, which is since, um, or Clarksburg. Uh, which has since uh, been closed. They only have a West Coast factory mm -hmm. now. But back then, they, the Clarksburg factory was putting out guitars for a few years. And it's before the famous Bob Bendetto conversation. I don't know if you know, but they were at a trade show. Eastman was at a trade mm -hmm. show. Bob Bendetto came by their, their uh, display and gave them probably a hundred thousand to five hundred thousand dollars worth of advice. Hmm. In that little brief meeting, the t the t the whole j the whole business of Eastman changed yeah. after that meeting with Bob Bendetto, mm -hmm. and so this is a pre-Bendetto when they were still trying to figure out what they're going to do. Uh, things to watch out for: these uh, tail pieces are made out of pot steel, and they will shear. They will break right here at the hinge if you're not careful. Okay. I've, I've seen them break in the past. Mm -hmm. Mine have held up held up over the years. But it's something to watch out if you get one of the, uh, even one of the ones from pre, let's say pre 2010 would be a, mm -hmm. maybe an arbitrary date. Uh, I've seen my, one of my students had one and his his separated. But they, this is when they were still, I guess, figuring out how they were going to do things. So you got the you got the um, the the Birdland tailpiece, but then you got a wood <laughs> yeah. a, a wood pick guard, solid ebony, which is kind of luxurious. 
And then you have one of the most beautiful budget backs I've mm. ever seen. This this back is That's insane for a cheap guitar. Yeah. Um, and the spruce on the front. And, and it's that, an that excellent deep. carve. Yeah. Everything's hand carved. It's a hand carved jazz box. Totally. So it's a, it's a it's a fascinating instrument, but it you know like I said for for I don't want to call it a junker because it is a it is a fine instrument, but compared to a Gibson, mm -hmm. uh, you can't you can't really compare them. Yeah. Uh, this and a kickstand was the one with the built-in built-in stand, so you could just prop it up on stage. <laughs> Patent pending. Is that patent never went through? I guess not. <laughs> and Which there's a, a piece of there's metal. a handy little magnet. Oh yeah. Did you see the magnet there? No. Oh, okay. There's a, look. Did you add that or no, is that, no, okay, that, that came, was that? Okay. Came with the guitar, belt buckle scratched most of the Man. down to the ash. Did you get this new or you've had this no, a long time? I bought it from Warren hmm. uh, Doval in nineteen eighty two. In fact, I bought the Tweed Fender Deluxe at the same time that I bought this from him. He sold it to me all in one deal. Interesting. And uh, this guitar is, uh, last time I used it was for a country session of, over in West Virginia for Jim McCoy. And um, it's quite a twang fest. Even, um, The bridge, see there's a bypass switch. Okay. The large knobs handle the neck pickup, then you kick back, and then you gotta make a handy switcherino. And now, I just got a reissue of one of these. I got a, a white one with humbuckers. Yeah, I always told people that if they could imagine a Stratocaster made out of chocolate and left out on the sidewalk on a hot summer day, <laughs> you got a Gil Thunderbird. Because they're hand wound de Armands, you get a much grittier tone uh, out of these than you would out of the humbuckers that Gil made. This one was my first decent guitar. I got it from a gospel singer when I was. I think 15 hmm. and my, um, I think one Christmas I had saved $150 to get a craw viola, I don't know if you ever remember those, they were a lute-like contraption hmm. made by Giannini and uh, I was 150 I was $50 away from the craw viola and my dad came home and he said he had a friend that was a gospel singer that needed to unload his music equipment. Hmm. And part of it was this dove. So and, what uh, year is this? This is a 69, I think. Okay. And it's the worst year. Hmm. <laughs> I hate to say it, but the the adjustable bridge was not a a plus. And, yeah. and uh, having this, even the pick guards uh, screwed is down. screwed down, That's which like totally killed the tone. Well, I had um, a Southern Jumbo, the same thing, with a screwed on pick guard and adjustable bridge and square yeah, shoulders. And, and it just totally wipes the tone out. But what I did was I strung it with strings made for Hawaiian slack key. What and is that? It, it's a style of music like, you know. It's like opiated country yeah. music, very, opiated. <laughs> very mellow and, and easy to play and easy okay. to listen to. So I, I set it up 
I use C tuning, F tuning, and uh, this is in G tuning, the traditional, most common tuning uh, for Hawaiian. And um, for, um, like I said, it can't be beat for the, the tone of that style of music. Yeah. Plus, if you capo this guitar at the second fret, it instantly gets rid of all the wonkiness and the over overly boomy mm. sound that the fat that this era of Gibson's had. Yeah. And then it becomes a very totally responsive instrument in any tuning. Uh, standard tuning, it, it would be fine. But like I said, it's salvation is using, um, I use John Pierce slack key um, uh, uh, strings for, on this guitar only. It's very full sounding. Oh, it is. And the volume is insane. I used this as a rhythm guitar in a kind of a folk jazz group back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. and, and this was whenever I needed to chunk out chords uh, rather than, I, I didn't have any arch tops back yeah. then. I had a Martin and I had this. So this was the, the loud guitar and the Martin was the soft mm -hmm. guitar, you know. Yeah. So, like I said, this one has a lot of personal uh, attachment simply because it was my first decent guitar growing up, you know. And it's connected to your dad and to sure. you working hard. Yeah, and Johnny Hawes was the singer that sold it to my dad. Mm. And Johnny was like, don't you play anything but religious music on this. <laughs> of course, I totally you flunked. <laughs> I, I, I didn't. Only manage. religious music. Right? Only religious music, so. Now what, there's a case back here on the bench. Ah, this, guy? Ah, this is one of the gems. Uh, I like the shape of this. It's a big one. This is a baritone made by Damon over near Charlottesville, who makes all manner of stringed instruments, mand uh, mandolas, mandolins, electric guitars, six strings. And this one is a baritone that he made. It just hums. I mean, it just. There's B. There's E. And of course, when you get over to what would normally be a D position, now you're an A. So, you know, like a. Magic 13th chord. And this, how big is this? This is a big box. Uh, it'd probably be an 18. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like a it's almost like a like an L1. Well, that's yeah. just like blown up. Like it's so Yeah, big. yeah. In fact, that body shape, yeah, this is about an 18. So come um, on, Gibson the shape. body the body shape of the old Gibsons, you know, it's like I think nowadays. I'll pull out the one Steve Parks made, and you'll see the similarity. And uh, it has his, he had a very organic way of making oh. uh, cutaways. But the, the lower bout is what we, on a, we call it a mini jumbo, which yeah. is kind of a, kind of a, you know. Uh, it's kind of a 185. I mean, a little yeah. reminiscent of that. Yep. This bridge is so incredible. That bridge is beautiful to look at, it looks like it but it doesn't up. leave a big enough footprint to be um, structurally sound. I've had to have this uh, redone twice. Really? The, okay. the uh, second time we did it in a way that it ain't gonna move. Okay. But 
because it, it's a pretty bridge, but the string tension is just too much yeah. with the footprint. So really what it needs is a squared off bridge. In <laughs> fact, at one time I thought about, if, if this solution hadn't have worked, we would have gone over to a square homemade bridge. Okay. But since it's, holding, it's held on for about three or four years now, mm. so I'm assuming it's gonna stay. Another notable thing on this guitar is, um, Steve Parks made this in the last uh, six months of his life. And he spent more time trying to decide what to put on the neck. And he knew how much I liked, you know, vintage music. So this is the Bluebird from the old Bluebird record label. Oh, man. This is a little Victrola. It looks like this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then up here is a shell that originally had a lot of pink in it. And that was, uh, he and I had the little grill at one time. And as a joke, thinking we were going to be evicted mm -hmm. when Christmas break, we painted the entire uh, dining room pink. I remember that. <laughs> okay, we did that out of spite to the landlord. <laughs> and so to commemorate the pink dining room, Steve put a pink piece in here that has since oh. faded down to normal. But the big deal was, of course, the Victrola and the Bluebird mm -hmm. record. I even had that design tattooed on my left arm. Well, I, hey, I think this is where I leave you. So, Bob, thanks for letting me come over to your house, Thank man. You. Thanks Good for to coming. see you. So, after this, what you're not going to see is we're going to go through and we're going to do some pictures and some appraising. Just talk about old vintage guitar values. But, um, man, you've been the people that I love how they play guitar in the valley. Most of them took lessons from you, as I think, through over the years. And then just you've been kind of the the aspirational version of what yeah, I want to be and a lot of people want to be. So thanks for that, man. Thank you. So, yeah. So, Bob, you've got a channel too, right? Yes, I do. I have a YouTube channel. It's Bobby Driver 2199. And it's a mishmash of everything from old-timey blues to religious music to Hawaiian slack key, cocktail jazz thrown in there. It's all kinds of stuff. So It's really check cool. Check it out. It's about 150 titles that you can dig through to find what you like. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll put the link in the description down below. And uh, you'll see some of these guitars in the mix too. So thanks for watching. I'm Jeremy. I'm the Guitar Hunter. Make sure you're subscribed. See you later.